What's good, everybody? Victory and Vices podcast, episode 24. Me, Rory Spooner, James Vec, back again. This is the official YouTube premiere. We've said this the past two weeks, and we've recorded like three hours worth of content that hasn't gone online due to various technical uh, difficulties, shall we say. But we're um, we're back, and uh, God loves a trier, so we're going to keep going until we get it right. You are going to see us one day on YouTube. So if you're watching it now, it's been a success, and I hope you're all enjoying so far. All right, so where do you want to start? United. We get United out of the way. We're going to start at United. Start you. That's All right, doing. first and foremost, um, full credit to Liverpool. Because yeah. as bad as United were, Liverpool were outstanding. Um, Liverpool right now are looking a million miles ahead of United. Would you say that's a fair show? Yeah, Gary Neville said it as well, didn't he? He actually used to assume that their poles apart. And I think that's pretty much spot on. They look, they, they couldn't look like two, two more different sides if they tried at the moment. Yeah. They just play a totally different brand of football. One's pleasing on the eye, one isn't. They, one, one team scores good goals, one doesn't. One can defend, one doesn't. It, it's just a completely polar opposite uh, football teams. When you saw the teams come out, what was your initial reaction? Well, I initially saw the team sheet with Smalling in it. Yeah. Um, and then I think... Palpitations, was, is that what you had? Yeah. Just uh, just, just, just disbelief. It, it, I almost seem to still get surprised every week when I see the team sheet. When I think the week before is bad... It's like Jose is kind of saying, "Aha, oh, hold up now. You wait till next week. We'll go one worse." And when I saw Smallin on the team sheet, I was like, "Meh." You know, Jones isn't in there. That's one positive. That's a plus, yeah. That's a plus. And then when Smallin pulled out, I think it was Bay. Did Bay come in? Bay came in, yeah. He was okay. You know, he did, he did, he did all right in, in spells. But you know, I thought you know without Smallin that it, it improved it slightly. But overall, he, he set it up like there was three in the back. But we both knew that. Dalot and Ashley Young weren't playing as wing backs. Oh, bro, no. Ashley Young, <laughs> Ashley Young, how that lad is still in a United shirt is beyond is beyond belief. I I really don't understand Manchester United Football Club anymore. To go to Anfield, I understand you have to be cautious, cautious, right? Yeah. Because they have so much talent and they're a very good side, right? But to be that conservative yeah, with a, a back twelve and a bus and a, a, a Donald Trump wall just blocking the fucking goal. It was so negative. You you know my opinions on Jose Mourinho. Yeah. I'm Jose out. I was very much Jose in for a, for a long, long time. But roughly around the Bournemouth game, that changed. He's not taking United any further. And I think the time has come for a change. Very quickly, are you still Jose in or Jose out? Um, yeah, I can tell you Jose in straight away. <laughs> no, I, I am very much leaning towards... Um, I want... To, it's, what I want is a change, is what I'll say. Is yeah, and if that change improves our situation, then I'm happy for Josie to go. If that makes sense, um, but I don't just want him out to just re- someone to replace it and the, the same problem to occur, because we all know that Josie is a, is a top quality manager and, and is and and was whichever you want to look at it one of the best. Yeah. Um, doesn't seem to have that glint in his eye anymore as if like he's as hungry for it as he once was but there are other factors involved so whilst part of me does kind of say oh, maybe it is time for him to go um, only if they're going to replace him with someone who's going to change things yeah I can't see that happening and I don't yeah me neither so uh, you know part of me is kind of saying well th- is there any point in him going then you know because I think he has to go I genuinely think that there's managers out there that can get more out of that team um, than he can right now. The whole situation with Pogba is just there's Seven. oh it's so detrimental to United right now. Who would, you, I, who would you rather see go first, Pogba or Mourinho? Honestly, yeah, Mourinho. I'd see Pogba go first before Mourinho. Mourinho. I just think he's it's just toxic. He's definitely divisive, but then would another manager? get the best out of him. Bear in mind now, Fred was bought specifically for Pogba to play alongside. So you would have a midfield of Matic, you'd have Fred and you'd have Pogba. Now Fred was designed, his signing was designed to release Pogba to allow him play further forward so he can dictate the game. Neither of them were to be seen at Anfield. Mm-hmm. That's, That's 104, what, we call it £150 million pounds worth of talent. Yeah. That uh, did Fred was Fred on the bench? I didn't. I, I don't even know. Martial was on the bench as well. There's more money on the bench. This is now. this is what I'm referring to now. There's no when United go forward. There's no attacking patterns, 
and when they defend, they're all over the shop. There's no player in midfield who can link midfield and attack. If you're if you're not willing to play Paul Pogba, okay, fair enough. But you need to have somebody who can link the play. You still need someone who can pass a ball forward. In the opening podcast, we talk about um, United quite a bit at the start of the season and what they were missing. And one of the things we established they were missing was when Paul Pogba is injured, there's nobody to play a forward pass. Matic is side to side or backwards. Herrera, side to side or backwards. Fred, side to side or backwards. Fellaini is just aiming for, you know, paramedics, firemen. (laughs) construction workers he, he's not aiming for the he's, goal he doesn't good, give a he's fuck good at that though he's very good <laughs> yeah, there's a good shot like if you if you if he was aiming for a paramedic it was a terrific strike it was a great strike but um yeah going back to what we were saying though united there's just there's so many more questions and answers and when you compare that to liverpool liverpool from the top down everyone's on the same wavelength they play this great brand of football shakiri by the way is he the sign in of the season for 13 million because I, are you going to get a better bargain than him? I'm pretty sure I said that when they sign him, it would be good business. And I'm pretty sure I also said that he would have his, his say and he would have his part to play. Yeah. Um, you know, granted the two goals that he scored, there was an element of luck in both those goals. Um, they did both look like they were going um, st- sort of straight towards the hair and potentially would have saved them. However, that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, you know, they both got deflected and they both went in. But he definitely made an impact when he came on and he it's not the first time he's done that this season um so he's definitely one of the better signings this season and um, just before you mentioned on pogba you said about um would another manager be able to get more out of him yeah do you reckon well i mean the the you the uv situation would give evidence towards that and um, one thing i would say though is that one of the greatest if not the greatest man manager of all time sir alex ferguson when pogba was 19 i believe it was said I don't want him, sell him. And he's worked with like Roy Keane's, Cantona's, difficult personalities before yeah, in the past. Yeah, true. It's very true. It's a valid and, point. And he's been very much able to get them to channel that and, and their talent to come through. So if Fergie looked at the Pogba situation and said, I don't want none of that. He's, he's this, he's that. He doesn't belong at our club. Why did he do that? Surely if anybody could have done that. It who, was, um, who was Juventus coach when Pogba was at Juventus? Um, Allegri? It was Allegri and it was someone else, I think. Was it Conte? Yeah, it might have been, yeah. Because they seemed to get the best out of him. Now, I know he was surrounded by far better players. And in a much different league as well. Nah, league-wise, yeah, okay, yeah. Granted, Serie A is is, is a little bit different, but... It's all slower, you know, as well, so... Yeah, to a degree, but I mean, even then, I'm looking at Allegri and Conte, who've built a side around Pogba and have, have... kind of give him this, not a free role, but a freedom to do what he does best. You know, he had Pielo and Vidal and Marquisio around him. Mm-hmm. Right now he's got Herrera, Matic and Fred Fine, yeah. and Fellini. Yeah. So ultimately, Pogba probably is very frustrated. He probably thinks, okay, I've asked Mourinho to attack. I've said it publicly. They've told me now that I can't speak to the press. He's had a pop of me on the training ground in front of everyone, including the cameras. He's called me a virus. And that, by the way, Mourinho allowed that to get out. Ferguson would never allow stuff like that to get out. Mourinho wanted the world to know Pogba's a virus. And I think Mourinho's time has come. When you compare him and Klopp, bro, Klopp is so far ahead of him. It's so far. It's, in, it's almost embarrassing. What are we now? We're, what's, what's today's day? Today's the, we're recording today's the 17th. And United are how many points off the top four? 19. Oh, also, my. Off top oh, four. Oh, 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 yeah, I, oh, Jesus, I thought it was even worse then. <laughs> Eight, ten, I think yeah. it's similar, yeah. 19 off Liverpool, that is, if you compare it's, the It's two. scandalous. I know yeah. you can say, okay, a few of the goals were lucky for Liverpool. To a degree, yes, they were. But they battered United oh, yeah. out of sight. They but, battered them. United, we've been calling United floppy cock FC, right? Because they're impotent. And Liverpool are the complete opposite of them. They're yeah. just a big, hard cock ready to fuck you. <laughs> let me tell you. Because United, they... I don't even want to watch them anymore, bro. They're so boring. Imagine you're, you're you're a United fan. That's your first United Liverpool experience at Anfield, and you've seen all these great games over the year. And you go there and you pay fifty, sixty pound a ticket to see a back twelve a lineup. Oh, it was horrendous. Yeah. It was so bad. And United as well. They faced thirty six shots um, <laughs> on goal from Liverpool. Um, granted, I think only ten or eleven of those were on target, but it just. That's the most, you know, the most shots United have faced on goal since up the stats began. So that was 36 shots. That Liverpool had in that game. That's what, what, an average a shot every three minutes. Yeah, pretty much just even that's, that. That's, I don't even know what to say. 
And yeah, like I say, you know, 11 of them are on target. Um, you know, there was a lot that weren't. But And the other stat I saw as well, I think, was every uh, every player in the Liverpool side, apart from Alisson, had a shot on goal. Well, no yeah, way, really. Again. That's your Van Dyke, Klein, Lovren. You know, I'm not saying any of them. Got How good goals. is Van Dyke, by the way? I know yeah, I've gone about, I've, I've gone on about him a lot, right? And again, I said this in last week's episode. I never actually made YouTube. I'm a firm believer that Van Dyke is now the best centre half in the world. It, for me, it's not a discussion anymore. His record with Liverpool this season, his composure, his I'll say his fitness as well because fitness is important. There's a lot of um, Mourinho brought up physicality and players that can't stay fit. Van Dijk is a great example of how to look after yourself. He, I think Graham Souness said he rarely gets out of like top gear. He, he looks like he's got another uh, gear he, to go. He's a bit of he's a brilliant. Beast. Oh, he's, he's an animal. And you know, I know I've, I've sort of argued the case of other defenders being on par with Van Dijk previously, but um, the way that he's going, he's kind of doing so much and doing so much for Liverpool Football Club that it's difficult to sort of build much of a case to say that he isn't either one of if not the best I think he's the, the best centre half in the world it was interesting you mentioned um, fitness um, I should have segues nicely into what I wanted to mention about Liverpool as well and it's their overall fitness I know I mentioned um, last week about Obviously, all football teams and players, you'd imagine, are very fit. But there's different types of fitness you know, in terms of the way they press and things like that. Um, the main difference that I saw between the two sides um, on Sunday was that United just could not cope with Liverpool's intensity. This And this is it. And this is what I noticed from Lukaku's game as well this season. I, was, I might have brought it up in previous podcasts. The lack of intensity in those lads. I, and I don't want to question people's professionalism. But... At what stage do you stop running? And Alan Shearer brought it up. If anybody didn't see it, um, maybe it's on YouTube. I haven't checked. But Alan Shearer highlighted Lukaku on, I think, was it match of the day too? Yeah. And he basically said Lukaku was hiding. And he was. And, it, and they show clips of him, bro. And it was horrendous for a man of his stature. And I know, right, yeah. he hasn't had the service. And like I said, there's no one to play that forward ball. So it's someone to link midfield and attack. So he has very little service anyway. But when you do get it, it was like the third or fourth minute. Van Dyke was like, this is my ball. I'm having it. This is my house. You ain't taking this. Yeah, and, and Lukaku shit himself. The thing is as well, it's confidence breeds confidence and all this positivity because when you're doing as well as Liverpool are and teams like City as well, um, because you're so confident and things are going so well, obviously you want to you know, do, e do even better for the manager and for the team. And you look at United players, they're so just dejected and just so short of confidence that... Yeah. You can just see it in their body language and the way that they play, how half-assed that thing seems it's to very be, half the attitude. And and that's why you've got a team that's so brim of confidence like Liverpool. And same when we played City, you can just see that their players just want it more. And Mourinho said interesting comments after the game about Robertson. I can't remember his exact words, what he said, but he mentioned He about, was tired watching him, I think yeah, he said. He yeah. said something along the lines of how it was just incredible to watch him just marauding up and down for like pretty much the full 90 minutes now while that's true Robertson is not the Terminator he's not a machine he's just another player who has been coached a to, certain way a certain way, way. Yeah, to yeah. be able to perform like that you know if he wanted to do that with Dalot or Valencia or, you know and I'm not saying these players are the same sort of caliber and you know might have the same end product whatever but in terms of just outright fitness and determination and, and you know just wanting to play for the manager he could coach them to do that. He but, should be coaching them to do that. Be. Let's just say that he should be doing that. But I don't know what it is exactly, but the players just don't want to do that. They don't have the same... You know, Are they playing for the manager? No. I said this weeks ago, I had the Juventus game completely papered over the cracks. Like I said at the time, if you go back to previous podcasts, I said Jose Mourinho must have a degree in interior design because he papered over every single crack that was there with that result. It masked the fact that United have so many deficiencies and they have so many questions that just haven't been answered. You could go through the spine of the team, right? So you go What's right back. Definitely need a new right back. Dallas too young. Can't rely on him. Probably need two centre-halves, right? Chris Smalling's been given a new contract. Let's reward more mediocrity. <laughs> Left back. You need someone who can compete with Luke Shaw, right? So straight away, we've established there's four players in the back they need. Minimum four, right? Win midfield. They need at least two players that can pass a ball forward. Plus, they need cover for Matic because Matic is getting on. They don't have another true defensive midfielder. So that's seven players. 
You could then argue they need maybe at least one out and out winger to supply Lukaku. That's eight. So that 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 takes maybe three or four transfer windows. And that's just in the starting eleven, let alone getting the the squad up to. The it's it's a, it's season. borderline embarrassing when you yeah. consider the money that they've spent, um, and it's just I don't know what they've bought. I mean, realistically, it's just how do you keep buying mediocre players? Well, the thing is, you've got United now, they've conceded 29 goals this season, which is one more than they did the whole of last season. To 28 was all they conceded last season. So it doesn't take a genius to realise that there's terrible defensive issues going on there. Um, It all comes back to me. I know we've sort of said about Mourinho in and out. We chatted about it earlier, but that comes back to Mourinho. Obviously, he tried to sign um, a couple of centre-halves. That he did, and he wasn't backed. Okay, so... The, the part that still baffles me is, right, is that Ed Woodward can obviously see that our defence is not great, right, last He season. doesn't give a fuck, though. Okay. And, and that's the doesn't worst care. part about it, is that he surely would have known that we're, that we're not going to get any better this season than last season. That last season as a whole, we papered over the cracks, finish in second. So that he surely he would have had to have said at the very least, look, it's a lot of money, he's too old, whatever, he doesn't sort of fit our agenda, but we're going to have to sign someone because exactly what's unveiling in front of our very eyes now was always going to happen but he just didn't seem to care like you say because just let it happen what you have to understand as well is when you operate a top level football club it's important that you have finance directors commercial directors people who understand the financial side of it right but you need people who understand the football side of it as well and united have nobody at boardroom level who who understands the football side of it that's the problem they're not like a bayern munich bayern munich the whole the whole ethos of the club is no matter what we do, football comes first. Money comes first to Manchester United now. Ed Woodward basically helped beg your pardon, Ed Woodward helped finance the um the Glazer takeover. So that's why he's in the position he's in now, is because he was their guy at the time. He worked for some bank. Um they liked the cut of his jib. They were like, Come work for us. They give him this job where he has massive responsibility on the playing team. That guy couldn't get in your local five a side team. He'd be the seventh pick on a five a side team. They wouldn't they wouldn't want Ed Woodward on their team. He doesn't know anything about football. So at what stage does he go into a different role? Because it, it, commercially he's terrific. Like nobody's getting other deals with, you know, all these companies out in Asia and, and he makes hand over fist money all the time. He's the best at what he does in that area. But he's not a sporting guy. And this is the problem. Also, quick heads up, I don't know if anybody saw it on Twitter. But I saw a little article about the Glazers actually looking to potentially sell Manchester United, which would be interesting if it went to a Saudi ownership because with their human rights record, I don't think United would have a player left by the end of the season, bro. Like, <laughs> they, they, so, a lot of people will go missing if they get United. Yeah, I believe that when I see it, you know. But um, let's get into that point where that's, I feel like that's the only solution. Is that they need to they need to sell the club, but they're not going to. So there's a lot of talk about director of footballs and things like that coming you know, coming in. And the the, the lad from RB Leipzig yeah, was mentioned. Is some I forget his name. Something Mitchell is it? Yeah, um, I don't I don't recall his name exactly. But I'm hearing there's sort of a few tweets and whispers and rumors yeah. about that. But um, you know maybe that will help something. But at the moment, um, it's just an absolute dire situation. Um, and I, th- I feel like we've said enough about this. Yeah, we won't talk about United anymore. Quickly, just to touch upon Liverpool again, because I found a really interesting article. Um, it was on tribalfootball.com, so shout out to them, because it's something I go on quite a bit. It's an article about Jurgen Klopp, and what's really interesting is Jurgen Klopp talks about potentially winning trophies, so I'll just read you some extracts from it, okay? Yeah, so um, let's have a little look here. So basically, this is what he says. If the people say the Champions League campaign last season was not a success because we didn't win the final, then I cannot change that. Is the finish successful? No. But the ride was brilliant. I enjoyed that a lot. Then the person says to him, but what about the trophies? No, that's true. But do I have to? Do I have to win it? Now, what Jurgen Klopp is basically saying in this article is winning trophies, he doesn't necessarily feel like he has to win them as long as the people enjoy the ride. And I get that because football's about entertainment, so yeah. the destination to the journey is very important. But that would be my one concern with Liverpool this season is do they have that mentality, starting with their manager, that they can win big trophies? 
because right now it, that article I don't again it, I don't know how well sourced it is but it sounds a little bit like he doesn't really care too much about winning and as long as you enjoy the actual destination to the journey that's the most important thing which I find a little strange yeah so whilst I like you said I do understand an element of what he's saying there um but I've been very quick to point out pr- previously um, in seasons gone by and I'm sure on, on episodes gone by on the podcast as well that for as good as they are and you could argue that they're even better this season the table doesn't lie no um, Stroot doesn't lie you know yes they were a little bit more easy in the eye last season um, but there's still that element about them and they've definitely uh, stiffened things up defensively okay the stats also back that up um, but I have been quick to point out previously that they are still without the trophy now there are Liverpool fans, and you know people like Reese who have also rightfully said last season and the season before, or well, you know, but they haven't spent the money um, that United and City have, and I sort of quick to say that's fair enough. Also, however, um, this season they have. Okay, so now that they've spent the money as well and brought in pretty much whoever they want, and they haven't just spent money in small amounts. They spent seventy five million on Van Dijk. Um, Allison was 60, 60 million. Um, Ox was 40 or 35. Cato, yeah. 50. Yeah, and I think um, Fabinho, 50 as well. Those are, Give or take, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. Those are big, big sums of money. And f- it's got to the point now where I think as a Liverpool fan, you do have to win something. And I don't even think it's something like the Carling Cup is enough or the League Cup or you know Carabao Cup, whatever you want to call it. Um, and whilst I understand what he's saying, that the fans love him and, you know, and everybody loves him at the moment. But how long will that last? How long does it last? It certainly buys him some time, though. It does, yeah. Buys but him an awful lot of time, in fairness. He's, you've got to, he's been there four or five years now. Oh, he's come, I think he's coming up to four years, I think, give or take. He's in his fourth season. Um, and he's not won a trophy. And I'm, that, I'm not overly criticising him because they're in a the damn better place than United are at the moment. And again, like the table shows, than pretty much every other team in the league. Yeah. But it only buys you a certain amount of time. Now, if he doesn't win anything this season... What then? And what if he then, you know, he's obviously going to be there next season. What if he doesn't end the next season? You know, if you to leave a legacy behind and for you to actually be remembered and your team to be remembered, they need to win things. That's that And that's uh, that's a valid point. That's what this article yes. actually states and at the end as well. Spurs are kind of not exactly the same, but obviously Potch has been lauded. On, a, a, on a smaller scale, yeah. On a slightly smaller, smaller scale, scale yeah. over seasons gone by. And obviously he's doing an amazing job this season, as we know. But there's sort of the same kind of conversation does tend to come up with Pochettino that, you know, he does need to win something. Um, maybe not quite a Champions League like a Liverpool or a league, yeah. but even a cup. So um, that argument will come back around, I feel, if they don't win anything this season. That Liverpool side, um, the article that I was referencing on tribal football there, it ends with basically saying, don't end up like Brendan Rodgers' team. For all the good football they played, nobody remembers them yeah. because they didn't win That's anything yeah. which is a fair shout but um, I think Liverpool will be there or thereabouts I, to, to be honest with you if they don't win a trophy this season any type of trophy I'd be gobsmacked because Man City for as good as they've looked look a little fragile this season they, they don't look like the same City they still look good but that game early January now is going to be pure fireworks City Liverpool as a yeah. neutral can't wait it just looks like um, teams have wise a little bit to City. Sort of where it was like City were up here, Liverpool a little bit down here, way off the pace. It's really sort of levelled at the playing field now, which mm. is great for the neutrals and the fans. And like you say, that game in January, is it? Yeah, early um, January. I don't know the exact date. Yeah, um, what a massive game that could be. Because mm. there's, uh, there's a point in there huge. at the moment. Um, yeah. But yeah, Liverpool certainly got um, a lot of good stuff to say about it at the moment. Uh, how could you not? Um, but that will remain the only sort of criticism um, unless they change out this season yeah well time will reveal all with that I suppose Um, moving forward with um, Liverpool um, yeah again I just want to say how how incredible have they been I mean I'm not a Liverpool fan for anybody watching but it's hard it's hard to not praise them it's very difficult to not praise them from Mm -hmm. the top down everything every single bit of the jigsaw has just fallen into place and if their destiny is not to win anything, I'd be very surprised. But yeah, but as I say, Liverpool terrific. United, I mean, we could talk about United for probably the next three days. And to be honest, with you, we wouldn't get any further because there's just there's just well, it's just a shambles from it's from start to finish, isn't it? Yeah, quite frankly, pretty much. But yeah, anyway, we'll move on from that because it was again terrific game though um, to watch. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, moving yeah. on to the other fixtures then. We'll start with one of the other Sunday fixtures too that I really enjoyed. Southampton Arsenal. Yes. Now Arsenal again not leading at half time. Which Indeed. which I was very surprised at. Now Ralph Hoosenhartel, did I say that right? Almost. How uh, Hoosenhartel. Hoosenhartel. You've you've got your U and your A's <laughs> fixed up for the wrong man. Hasenhutl? Hasenhutl. That's it. Hasenhutl. Do you have to say it in like an Austrian accent? Definitely not. Hasenhutl. But it sounds better when you say it in a... Hasenhutl. So Ralph. I'll call him Ralph, Ralph for now. Ralph. We'll go with Ralph. Yeah. yeah. Ralph was... Um, bro, he did his thing. I, lo- I love the touch um, he did of giving all the Southampton fans a free drink. Did you see that yeah. at the start? Yeah, that, yeah. to me, speaks a man who understands football culture. Such a and, small gesture. Oh, it's right? such a small gesture that goes a long way. But for a team that are struggling, let me tell you, that was absolutely incredible. I thought it was just, talk about customer service. He's like, have a free drink on me. And by the way, we'll get a banging 3-2 win as well. <laughs> and we'll have you on the edge of your seat the entire game. It was a great game to watch. Yeah, um great. Shout out to Leno at the end as well. I don't know if you saw Leno at the end of the game. Do you see him go up to Charlie Austin? And he went to, he went like that to Charlie Austin as if to say, I was that close. Bro, you may as well have been that close. It doesn't matter. Like it, no. Charlie Austin's looking at him like, bro, I don't give a fuck. Like, I still scored. Yeah, like, he's doing this. Like, he's like, oh, yeah, but I was this close. Yeah. And Charlie Austin's like, well, well you know, still scored, whatever. No, he's a geezer and a half as well, Charlie Austin. He is, he's probably he? like that. Park life, Charlie, yeah, isn't he? I don't give a fuck. Like, I, I like Charlie. He's a good yeah. lad. Um, it was a great game. Danny was. Ings scored, was it two headers? Two, yeah. Arsenal um, were very much exposed at the back. I'm going to do, in the new year, um, basically a rundown of the top six sides for now. Might do some other teams as well. But what I'm going to do is some separate videos where we analyse three transfer targets for each of the top six clubs. And I'm probably going to just chuck every decent centre-back available in that Arsenal video because they really need, I would say, at least two centre-halves and maybe a left-back as well. What would you think? I wonder your opinion on this. What would you think about Ben Chilwell to Arsenal? I think he fits the way that they play. I think he's a terrific left-back. And we've um, praised him, and rightfully so, um, on episodes gone by. I know Leicester haven't had the best sort of run of games no. recently, um, but he's been one of their sort of standard performers. I could see him said. pushing Nacho Monreal for a start. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I, there's no reason why he couldn't completely displace Nacho Monreal. Yeah, yeah, he's, true. He's yeah. not all that good, Nacho Monreal. He's not a bad player. How old is Ben Shilwell? In my head, I want to say 21. He's, he's young. He's very young. He's, he's still only young. Isn't yeah. he? I'm going to say 21, but I need to fact check it. Mm-hmm. That that'd be a good show, and it, it's certainly a, the type of player that Arsenal could pull off. That's not a um, an unrealistic signing to make. No, and it's I, not. And I don't think he would cost a, that huge sum of money because he's been. He'd chilled probably on. be about well, it depends how many years are on his contract. I'd say probably minimum forty million. Now he's bought yeah. into the England squad, which in today's market is it's not that not, much. Not is that it? much it's very inexpensive. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, we, we we spoke about United's dire defensive situation. Arsenal's is a little bit better, but it's not that much better. Koscielny came back. Um, and what was could, he doing? Do you know where he he went to head the ball? He should have he should have gone to head the ball, but up, yeah. he put his foot up. Um, he was completely exposed. Maybe it was because he has been out for a while. He's yeah. not a bad player, but again, I don't think he's a top class centre half. When fit and with a good run of games behind him, I do believe him. And I think it was Socrates was missing as well. Um, uh, yeah, I'll call him that because I can't say his other name. So yeah. But, but Past a pop a loss, something like that, isn't it? Oh, yeah, something like pop that. A, pop a dop a lop a dop a dop a dos. Something like that, Greek. Pop a pop a pop. <laughs> pop a <laughs> pop a lop a dop a loss, Hassan Hotel. <laughs> Socrates um, and Ralph um, yeah. are certainly better, um, for yeah. step, especially for you to pronounce. Yeah, I can't pronounce um, them. But I don't think he played, and I they did seem to miss him. Kashani yeah. came back, but when he is, like I say, got a good run of games behind him. Um, he certainly is one of, if not their best, best centre half. Um, what he's doing, trying to get his leg over that ball, I don't know. Yeah, I thought Shaka um, would be the problem at centre half, um, and he wasn't overly convincing. But the more established centre backs, I kind of feel like they should have, they should have yeah. t- took him under their wing and led him a bit more. We've mentioned about Leno in the past as well, about you know if Arsenal finally sort of solved their goal. Still question again. marks now. Still question marks. Yeah, um, what he was doing for that third goal, I will never know. Um, it's just a just a bad call. He's coming such a long way, um, and he just wasn't even close. He's, yeah. he's saying that. You may yeah, you may as well have been yeah, in my lower. He was nowhere near. Um, but it it was a very very good performance by Southampton, and 
I mentioned to you, um, I think it was last episode or the episode before about um, Ralph um, sort of wanting to change or wanted to bring yeah, in a lot of the fitness. the high press, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and change sort of how they approach games in terms of their fitness level. And I mentioned that would be difficult to do in sort of the how congested the fixtures are on Christmas. But I don't know if you know this, but towards the end of the game, a lot of the Southampton players were pulling up a I, cramp. I noticed one thing as well, and I say that to say this. The passion that those lads showed, right? I think it was like it might have been it was the early eighties. So it might be the eighty second, eighty third, eighty fourth minute, where there was a they. I think they had a corner, and Arsenal were on the counter attack. Those lads, they steamed back. Yeah. They like they wanted it so bad, and I knew they wouldn't lose after that. I think it, it must have been two two because it wasn't three two at this yeah. point. I think, and um, I was watching it, and I just remember thinking, wow. Well, they already bought into what he wants. Yeah. And yeah, they were cramping up a lot because it's hard to maintain that press, but they did it very well, though. But that was just a sign of how much effort that they put in um, throughout that game. And like you say, you can see that um, he's sort of stamping his blueprint on that team already in terms of how he wants them to play. Yeah. That was a very good Southampton performance. Oh, it's superb. You know, Arsenal haven't gone 22 games and beaten or whatever. Oh, 23, was it? 22? 23? Yeah, I think it was 20. That was twenty two, and then you know it would have been twenty three. Yeah, yeah. They, they haven't gone that many games unbeaten for a re, you know for no reason, especially in the second half. That's where they tend to come on even stronger, and Southampton were the ones that actually won the second half and ultimately yeah. won the game. Um, so you can, as I say, you can see already what he's trying to do with that team. And yes, they were cramping up, but that will improve. And if that's a sign um, of what's to come for Southampton fans. Um, then we mentioned earlier on in the season about you know we think they could potentially be safe. I know I sort of tipped them to go down, but I did also mention that they are one of those clubs who would bring a managerial sack in, in and bring someone in better, yeah. which they may possibly have just done. Well, it's definitely going to be interesting. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. They could turn a corner. What they need is momentum, and that's an excellent start. I don't think I oh, they could have probably had a tougher game. In fairness, you know they could have got a Man City or Liverpool, but Arsenal in the form that they're in to actually turn them over at home. It's terrific, bro. Yeah, it's um, certainly quite a difficult game for them. Is they couldn't have been that many tougher games, um, but they did very, very well. And I, I don't think they've got the best run of fixtures coming up. I'm going to get them up in a second. Yeah, but, I haven't seen them um, actually. Yeah, but while I while I sort of do so, um, just a couple of stats um, for you doing that game. Um, so there was three headed goals in that game by Southampton: two by Ings, one by Charlie Austin. Um, that's the first um, time we've seen three-headed goals in one game um, since 2016, um, when really? West Brom did it against the Swans. Really, I did not know that. Indeed. And also, Charlie Austin has now scored um, in all of his five games against Arsenal. Every time he's been against Arsenal, he's really? scored. Really, and that's only bettered that 100% record of a player scoring against a team every time he's played by Raheem Sterling and Bournemouth where he scored in all six times that he has played yeah um, so yeah a couple of sort of interesting stats there um, but Southampton's upcoming fixtures now um, yeah they've got so they've got their way to Huddersfield which I would back them to win winnable 100% um, then their home to West Ham which will be tough yeah um, but then they've got um, City home and Chelsea away which isn't the best. If they can get if they can get six points out of those games, that's that's not bad. Those four games, I, yeah. I, I would take six yeah. points from that. Considering their sort of recent form, um, you would take two wins out of four there, wouldn't you? Oh, 100%, um, yeah. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to kind of see now. Obviously it's a one-off game. Um, if they can maintain that um, going forward to that, then I would certainly suggest that they really could be okay. Yeah, totally agree. Mm-hmm. Let us know what you think in the comments, guys, about United, Liverpool, Southampton, Arsenal, any other team as well. Right now, what's going to come up next on your screen will be our IG ads, our Twitter ads. So for me and Vecchi, you'll also get the VMV ones. Take a minute to go and have a look at them. Follow us. Let us know your opinions. We're really sociable. We want to interact with everyone. And right after that, we'll be back. we got more action. All right, so Chelsea Brighton. Let's take a little look at that game because another interesting game and uh, my boy, Eddie Hazard. Mm-hmm. Now, last week you were slating him. You, you were talking a lot of trash about Eddie Hazard. You were like, he isn't doing anything. But I got some interesting stats <laughs> about him. So I'll let you have your say and then I will gently intervene and be like, this is why you're wrong. So yeah. you, you, you say what you're going to so say. I want to just firstly put on record that 
I wasn't talking that much trash about him. I was still giving him a little bit of credit. However, up until this weekend, I did point out that he hadn't scored a goal for what was like 10 or 11 games. That, now, that's true. Fact. For a man of his caliber um, and the way he plays on the pitch, I and others felt that he should be scoring more goals. Um, and I did also point out that when someone like Lukaku goes on a very similar run, then he is widely slated, whereas Hazard was not. Now, what I will say, just to sort of play devil's advocate myself with that one is, yeah. outside of scoring goals, he is still doing a lot more than what someone like Lukaku was. And he is constantly assisting goals. These are facts also, yeah, okay. keep going, yeah. Um, of which he assisted again a Pedro's goal this season and he did get on the score sheet himself. Um, Back to again, yeah. Okay, I'm liking when this is going. Up until Messi um, got a hat trick and two assists this weekend, yeah, um, he was um, or he had the most assists in the top five leagues in Europe with nine. I'm just looking at it now. Um, but I think Messi is just sort of yeah, Messi um, and Ronaldo have taken or taken over now. I think gone yeah. past that. But um, I just felt more in recent games that he dipped off and he should have been doing better. But in terms of go- uh, scoring goals. Yeah, um, I'm just having a look at it now. I'm um, just having a look here. So um, we have, uh, 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 he has, um, I'm trying to look at it in depth. And it's on the BBC website. If anybody wants to look at it, feel free to look it up and double check it. Season after 16 games played. So this season, 2018-19 season, he's had eight goals and nine assists. Mm-hmm. So he's been directly involved in 17 goals, which is quite deceptive. Because as you it's say, as you just yeah. say, he's kind of, been on the peripheral of things he hasn't really been that guy that's you no know, fireworks every other game but he's gone about his work in not a qu- not a quiet way i suppose but he's just gone under the radar and he's still doing what he's supposed to be doing yeah and also what i what i would like to say on that as well is we kind of forget that he had a blistering start okay and he had seven goals and i'm not sure how many assists in probably just as many games yeah and the, what sort of hasn't gone in his favour and which has made it look maybe that he's not doing as well as he was is he sort of went on an upward curve and then he dipped right down and now he's coming sort of back up again. Yeah. If those 17 goals were spread out more evenly across the then season... Then it'd be more noticeable. It'd be more noticeable, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so sort of he's gone on a massive up, sort of levelled a little bit and now he's sort of um, on, on the up again. So like I say, if that was more sort of spread evenly, I think they'd be calling him more consistently a better player. Yeah. Um, second half, I mean, Brighton went for it. First half, I kind of watched and I thought they showed a bit too much respect to Chelsea. Yeah. Um, Brighton fans will probably agree with that as well. I think if they got at them from the get-go, they probably might have easily took a point, maybe even got three yeah. points. It was it was a nervy end uh, for, for Chelsea. Um, from They seemed pretty comfortable up until the Solly March goal. Yeah. Um, but like you say, you know, if it's you know hindsight would, would tell us a lot, but um, it certainly showed that when they did start to get at them, um, you know, they got the goal and and there could have been more in it. So um, Chelsea don't lose to Brighton. I think they've won every game they've played against them um, in the Premier League, from from what I've read. Um, but like you say, maybe if maybe if um, Brighton had have sort of got a, bit more a, conviction. Li- a little bit sooner, yeah, then, yeah. you know, it could have been different, but um, ultimately it wasn't. No, very true, very true. All right, Fulham West Ham. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I predicted West Ham would get in the top eight at the start of the season. Not far off. Not far off. The start that they had was horrendous. Um, it was it was a terrible start. They were still trying to mesh everything together. Um, yeah. They look terrific now. They've got so much firepower. And Pellegrini, bro, is he potentially the most underrated coach in the Premier League? Bear in mind, he's actually won a Premier League. There's a lot of managers out there who get... Tons of plaudits, right? And rightly so, they're very good managers. But this guy's actually climbed the mountain and done it. Yeah, I wouldn't say so much that he's underrated because, like you say, he's won the Premier League title and he was very highly praised for it when he did win it. But I think that because someone of his quality has now gone to someone like West Ham, he is going under the radar, the job that he's doing. I'd say so, um, yeah. I'd, I'd say I think he's he's lifted to ninth now, I want to say, West Ham. Uh, West Ham are, yeah, they're ninth, ninth. on 24 points. And so they're, they're only two points behind United in sixth. They so, are, yeah. So, you know, that's one win, and, and we could be calling them a top six side, potentially, mm. okay, depending yeah. on how the results go. Um, that is also another, that's West Ham's fourth win in a row. And it is the first time they've won four Premier League games um, in a row since 2014. Yeah. 
which is good for you as well. That's four, that's four it is. seasons. That's the right. one thing they've always lacked is consistency. Yeah, They've always had players, West Ham, that you could turn around and go, oh, they're right, really good players. Even as far back as the old days, you've got your Lampards, your Joe Coles, Rio Ferdinands, Michael Carricks, De Canio. Now they've got Arnautovic, Felipe Anderson. Yeah. You know, they've always had very good football players, but they struggle to sort of mesh everything together and get that one manager in charge that goes, okay, yeah. I'm the guy that's going to piece this jigsaw together. And I like the fact that West Ham are on the up. They're a very big club. We, we, club, yeah. we, we need clubs like West Ham to be competing yeah. and to, to make things interesting. Otherwise, it just gets still. Yeah, and um, we speak about confidence as well, it being such a big thing. And that's certainly what they've got at the moment. Um, you look at players like Robert Snodgrass. Um, yeah, unbelievable know, turnaround he, for Snodgrass. He was nowhere to be seen um, yeah. until quite recently. He was on loan at Villa, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, he was, and, so, yeah. and he hadn't scored since he played for. Was it since uh, under twelve? I think he hadn't scored. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was, it was a fucking long Hull time. Or something like that, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. So, um, he his goal was very, very good. He took that goal very well. And yeah. Then, it obviously helps matters then when you've got players like Felipe Anderson. Yes, his goal sort of may have dropped. One of my slightly. favourite players in the Premier League right now, Felipe uh, Anderson. But he assisted again. Um, well, he's, he's, on, he's on fire. He's, and if he's not scoring, he's directly involved in the goal. So you can't knock the guy at the moment. Um, he's doing very, very well. I think it was Balbuena who actually got the man of the match award and he was he was terrific as well. So um, at the moment, uh, you know, again, you, there's not many bad things that you can say um, about West Ham. Their next four games as well. Are also very very winnable games. They have got Southampton. Sorry, they got Watford. Yeah. Then Southampton, then Burnley, and then Brighton. I, put it this way, I don't expect them to get the full twelve points, especially they, over Christmas period. But if you could get, well, let's nine, say nine max. Ten. Yeah, no, at least, I, I say nine max. But I mean, if they, they they are very much capable of getting them all. Though. Getting all twelve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like like you say, no. With over the Christmas period, with the congested fixture list, um, it would be a tough ask to win all four games. Um, but there's certainly not one team they would look at in that run of fixtures and, and worry about at all. No, I don't think West Ham have to fear anyone. No. Uh, the way they're playing um, and the manager that they've got, they can certainly do a number on anybody. Yeah, so it was, a, it was another terrific uh, win for West Ham. I say four on the spin, more misery on Fulham. Yeah, no, un- unlucky Fulham. We won't go into Fulham too much because... Um, we know their issues. We've already been over their issues, and quite frankly, Stevie Wonder can see Fulham's <laughs> issues. <laughs> they're, they're, they're plain to fucking see, let me tell you. Um, Wolves and Bournemouth, then. Let's have a little crack at that, because um, yeah. Wolves are back on the up again. Um, very good win against a very good Bournemouth side. Some Two teams who you would think would be competing for the top ten. Yeah, and, and I believe they both are as well at the moment. They're I think the... Sort of uh, so a little luck. Eight, is it? So the top ten um, will go from six down. So you've got United in six. Wolves in 7th, oh. Everton in 8th, West Ham in ninth, Watford in 10th, Bournemouth in 11th, so and Leicester in 12th. So they're a point outside Bournemouth out of the top 10 at the moment. Um, when I watched this game back, um, neither side like particularly impressed me that much. I know what you mean, they didn't excel in any way. It, yeah. it wasn't the, the greatest of games, um, but I suppose when you've got two sort of sides that are sort of on the same sort of par I would say at the moment in, in their season sort of playing Give or similar take, yeah, style yeah. In, in similar league positions before the match as well Yeah, um, it wasn't so much surprising um, it was Jimenez that got the goal that put them in front yes um, it was yeah and Bournemouth were really really pushing for the equaliser and while they were pushing they got caught a little bit and the second sort of obviously winning then so um, on paper it looked like a very comfortable 2-0 win for Wolves yeah um, it wasn't but quite but it didn't tell that. the whole story yeah yeah but you know Wins a win. That's three in a row for them again now. Um, you know, we spoke about their dip in form and the losses that they had. I think it was they, they, it was four, five, maybe six games they went without a win. Yeah. Um, but they seem to have rediscovered some confidence now. Do you think they'll finish in the top ten? No. You think it'll be just outside? Just, I, I think they'll definitely. They, they're more than doing enough now to render themselves safe. I think. Yeah. Either way, um, it's a successful season, yeah. though, right? But I, I, mean. I would say, uh, if you're going to push me, I would say sort of eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth around there. No, no shame in that. So no. any Wolves fans watching, yeah, absolutely no shame in that. That would be um, very that'd good be a, that'd be a very very good season for yeah. them. So um, yeah, shout out to Wolves. Bournemouth again, got nothing to worry about. They'll probably be in and around top ten. Um, again, we'll go over Bournemouth in in a lot of depth another time. But um, Eddie Howe doing a terrific job. Um, Watford Cardiff. Okay, now when Watford went three nil up, I thought this could be thirty three nil, and somehow Cardiff sort of clawed it back a little bit Junior Hoyler what's he been doing in training to score these screamers that that second goal oh bro yeah, that he, was some strike he only recently 
did all, that almost that exact same goal recreated a couple of weeks back again. Yeah. Um, I think they might even won goal of the month, I think. Hell um, of a strike. But that, that's two and four for Hoylet now, and that's as many goals as he's managed in his previous 61 Premier League games. That's incredible. Um, so I think the, the word confidence keep com- you know it keeps coming up but yeah. we know and they that. need and they need confidence yeah. players and Cardiff need players that are going to be able to create for them mm-hmm. a junior highlight is essential for their survival they need someone who's a going to take chances and b make chances if you don't take them or make them you're not staying in the league so hopefully he can kick on a little bit and start to do his thing yeah and he's he's what I like to sort of um, describe as a flair player as well as that. Yeah, would you say he's a luxury player for a team like Cardiff? Kind of, to a degree, yeah, of. yeah. Because they don't have a lot of luxury or, or flair, like I say, um, in their side. Now you look at, you know, we know all the big teams have got some flair in there, and and lots of it actually. Yeah. But you know, you look at teams like um, your Bournemouth, you know, they've got flair. You look at um, Watford, they've got like the Delafeos. Delafeo, um, by the way, again. Bro. Yeah, look, yeah. <laughs> He was Unreal. superb, and I'll, I'll definitely come back to him. But you know, you've got like your Leicesters, you've got like your, um, you know, your Madisons and things like that. And Palace have got your Zaha, Fulham have got your Schurlers, and yeah, they're, miss, they're missing that sort of X factor a yeah. little bit. Yeah, yeah, and I think that Hoylet is that for Cardiff. Yeah, and he's, he's just something or nothing player that was going to potentially produce goals like he is doing at the moment. Um, when things aren't particularly going their way, like the, it was when they were three 0 down. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it it didn't matter. Um, but I'm sure Neil Warnock will be pleased with the way they responded. The resilience they showed. I, I you know, he'd be very. Can't question that. No, you can't question that. Yeah. Some of the quality, okay, perhaps you could, but um, I mean, we kind of knew that already, didn't we? So we're not learning yeah. anything new. Well, they seem to have kind of mastered their home form a little bit, Cardiff. They know how to win at home. Um, the next task for them is trying to get an away. Um, not just performance or sort of fight back, but an actual full result. Yeah. Um, and that that was the first time Cardiff has scored twice in a away game um, for the first time since 2014, where they still didn't win the game. Well, they really? They all with West Brom. Hell of a start. Um, so they're not good on the road, but we didn't expect that, you know. So like you say, when they came back to 3-2, you know, we thought, could there be a shock on the cards? Um, it wasn't to be... Um, but just to sort of praise and my play of the weekend, just going to put it out there. Um, I guess, is it Gerard Delafeo? Delafeo? Delafeo, I'm going to say. But I'm not the guy to be asking. So. <laughs> no, that's very, very true. Uh, he got a goal and what a goal. Um, can I also just say... He's some player. That game itself was like a, a goal of the month competition on its own. Yeah. Holobas's goal as well. Oh, terrific. Oh, terrific. What a brilliant... The lad they signed from West Ham for a million... Um, uh, bring up his name now. Yeah. He was so impressive, bro. I'm wondering yeah. why West Ham give him away so cheaply. Yeah. Because him and Reese Oxford is another one. You've got two lads there who could easily be part of a West Ham playing squad over the course of a season. So, I again, I don't know why he left. If any West Ham or Watford fans know specifically the reason behind him leaving, um, you know, tweet us, let us know in the yes, comments. No, yeah. Um but I, I'm, yeah. I'm interested to know why he's left. Um, was it Queenus? Am I saying that right, Queenus? Oh, the youngster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was he? You see him when I got the third goal. He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He got the goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, Dale. Oh, Queenus. Queenus. I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. He was he 19 years old. Yeah, 19. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know that as well, actually, because he looks very, very promising. Yeah, I'm interested to know why you yeah. would let a. a Clearly, a quality nineteen-year-old goal for some for such a cheap sum of money as yeah. well. Perhaps there were just opportunities that sort of weren't coming in for him, but um, he certainly made a. If he if that's his decision, then it's a very bold move. Yeah, um, look, you got to admire the. Yeah, you got to admire it. Yeah, yeah. but um, D- De La Feo, um, he was my play of the weekend because his goal was excellent. Um, very very good feet. Yeah, and and he knew that the Cardiff defenders knew. That they couldn't touch him in the box. Yeah. Um. So once he had his little twinkle toes and got his way in, very good finish past uh, Neil Etheridge as well. Um. But I just think he's a massive asset to Watford. When when he's on form, he can pretty much do what he wants. He's probably one of the most naturally gifted players yeah. in the league. And you can kind of see um the Barcelona esque sort of player in him. Yeah. I know he ultimately didn't didn't come off from like so many other players. I still think he can well. play at a bigger level though. But yeah, he has it in him if he can sort of get some sort of consistency going. Um. But yeah, he was great and. He was my player of the weekend as well. All right, terrific. Yeah, uh, to be honest with you, uh, he was close to being my player of the weekend, but I give it to Robertson quite simply because he was an absolute machine um, up and down the left for Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Um, Moving on, Tottenham-Burnley. Now, Burnley thought they had it, bro. 
But Christian Eriksen came along and broke their hearts. Um, Burnley, fair play to them, bro. Going to Wembley and... Doing a United. Do, park, I don't want to say park in the bus, right? Because I don't want to disrespect Burnley like that because I know they've got a bit of quality in the side. But they kind of managed their own expectations a little bit. They were like, a draw wouldn't be the worst result here in the world. No. Especially to build a bit of momentum. And they were so close to getting it as well. But as we said in the last episode, if you haven't actually listened to our SoundCloud, go back and listen all on the ep- to, the, um, to the other episodes from the season. We've constantly admired how Spurs have beaten smaller sides. Not that they can't beat bigger sides, but Spurs kind of are very smart in terms of who they beat, which keeps them in the top four. And that's another one of those games where, yeah, yeah. you know, it's just another three points, W on the board, momentum keeps going. They, they're, they're, they're where they need to be. You've got to admire that with Spurs. Yeah, you've got to give them a lot of credit. Yes, they left it late. And would you believe that's uh, Christian Eriksen's first goal this season? Uh, uh, surely can't be, is it? This is his first goal this season, yeah. I'm sure. Oh, no, I, you know, he scored for Denmark. That's what I'm thinking yeah. of. So all his goals have been for Denmark. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, he's certainly been involved, you know, and I'm sure he's assisted goals as well, but that's his, uh, his first goal of the season and, and what a time to get it. Um, with Burnley, um, I know you said that, you know, looks like they played for a point. I'm going to tell you, they definitely played for a point. Sean Dyche and the players may tell you that they didn't play for a point. But they did. But the fact that they didn't have a shot on target the whole game. Yeah. And that's not the first time this season. That is the third time this season that Burnley have failed to register a shot on target. And no other team in the league has failed to do that more than They once. have the limitations, yeah. but at the same time, I don't, I'm not going to disrespect them and say... Yeah. Um, th- you know, I, I, I'm not going to say they can't do X, Y, and Z when clearly they have players who can, but... It's like, it's like you said, I think they manage their own expectations. The thought that it's a very unlikely prospect that we're going to get all three points here. Yeah. So we're at best, we're going to shut up shop and we're going to play for one. And if we just so happen to come across three, then we're obviously going to take that. That's a very Mourinho-esque yeah. tactics, that is, in fairness. But with a club that you can understand. that that's Yeah, I understand tactics. why Burnley would go yeah. to a Wembley and be like, you know what, let's let's you know, let's not try and get our asses handed to us. And Joe Hart um, made some good saves. Uh, did, Burnley yeah. themselves were very, very resolute in defence. Um, and you... You could argue that the timing of the goal would say that they were hard done by, but on the actual balance of play, they were very much outplayed. Yeah. Um, and there, there was a lot of chances for Spurs in that game. Um, and it was one of those sort of games where if they hadn't have gone on to win the game, it would have been pretty criminal. They didn't get all three points out of that. Yeah. And it would have been sort of two of the biggest points dropped that you've seen this season so far, I would say. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's a fair assessment in fairness. The game, there wasn't an awful lot to shout about. As you say, it was quite one-sided, but... Again, I think Burnley will be okay. I like Burnley as a club. I hope they do yeah, be okay. Yeah. But yeah, um, going on to um, the next game. So we'll have a look at Newcastle Huddersfield. Again, we'll just touch upon it very quickly because it's not a massive amount to shout about. The Rondon goal um, was excellent play. It was, goal, it was yeah. a really good, well worked team goal. Um, I kind of expected Huddersfield to get something from this, but what that signifies to me now is the fact that they haven't got something. Especially against a, a relegation rival, quote unquote, mm-hmm. I think that will damage their confidence quite a bit going forward. I think those players they would have looked at that game and thought, if we can get something from this, again, key word today is momentum. We can build momentum. We can move forward. Right. We can build confidence. Yeah. And to lose to a Newcastle team that have been pretty bang average all season, you do fear for them now, and you think, okay, we were at that Christmas point where. We kind of established now who's going to do what this season. And I, I'm pretty sure Huddersfield will go down, bar some type of miracle. Yeah, it looks extremely likely that Huddersfield are going to go down. And the main issue is, and I've been banging the drum, the drum about this quite often this season, their main issue is that they just can't score goals. Mm. They don't have issues creating chances, but they have major issues with scoring them. And I think they had... 60 70 odd percent possession in this game as well yeah so you can get the stats up um but it it's not for the lack of them being in games and having the ball they're not they're not out the game certainly you can't we're not watching how to and saying oh you know they just they're so poor in quality that they know they're not getting on the ball they're not creating chances mm. they're doing all of that yeah they just don't have that quality and i you know we said about players with flair or when i've said with, in, in the players, past yeah. about players just goal scorers like your glenn murray's and um, you know, sort of Callum Wilsons and, and just people who will will score you goals. They don't even have that. Yeah, um, that's and that, the stats. That for me is their biggest issue. And you know, you've got 
Newcastle, you know, they've got Rondon, who at the moment seems to know where the goal is as well. That goal that they scored was, that wasn't Newcastle. Did they space jammed that from somewhere? Yeah, didn't it they? didn't look like the Newcastle goal. Um, Newcastle again, I think they'll be okay. Rafa Benitez. Difficult uh, to say, though, isn't it? Rafa Benitez is the most important person in that club at the moment. He has the patience of a saint to put up yeah. with some of the shit that's going on there because, let me tell you, any other person would have just got to pay off and walked away. Clearly, Rafa Benitez cares about Newcastle Football Club. That's the one thing I take from Newcastle this season is that they have a manager who genuinely gives a shit yeah. and wants them to stay up and wants them to probably even thrive. But again, he's probably just trying to manage his own expectations. There's a guy that's managed at the top level and now he's, he's got no budget to work with. He's probably yeah. one of the most unsupportive chairmen in the world. A fan base that's pretty divided. It's not an easy job, especially trying to mesh what you would say together average players, some of them. Because a lot of those Newcastle players are not Newcastle players or, or quality. or They're not of the quality that Newcastle are used to over the years. Yeah, so that's true. It is a diff- it's a difficult job. Yeah, and he did uh, an incredible job last season to get them to finish where they were, because um, you know they looked in a bad way at, at a certain point in the season um, once again. And and if he does something similar this season, I know they they currently sit in fourteenth place. Um, it gets uh, four points above the relegation zone. It's lucky um, now, yeah. And you know we mentioned you know maybe five or six games back that they looked bang in trouble. Oh yeah, in hugely trouble. in trouble. Yeah, you know, they they wouldn't win it at home. They weren't scoring goals. We threw in some crazy stats about how it was their worst, you know, run of this or run of that since this, you know games. I think it was one of the stats was even eighteen something, wasn't it? Mm. Um, when we look back, so um, I kind of sort of asked myself, why do we do sort of doubt Rafa Benitez? Because his CV will tell you that he's a very very good manager, mm. and I kind of think that if he gets them anywhere close to the top ten this season, Newcastle or maybe even twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, that is one hell of a job. Because you talk about teams that oh, it's a brilliant job, bro. Teams that don't have financial backing. Are, are there teams that have any less financial back in than Newcastle in the Premier League in terms of net spend? Just, just in in general, they, they um, I don't, I they're probably the lowest. They, they are. I'd have to look. They have the stats, to be the lowest, or within the bottom three or four clubs in terms of money available and what they actually spend. So what he's doing at the moment um, is very, very good. Um, Isn't there record signing still, Mike, Mike Lowen? Lowen? Yeah, still Mike is. Lowen? Yeah. yeah. God, that's horrific. From 2000, and, I'm sure recent time, 2005, 2006, something like that. 2000 and something, yeah, yeah. A long, long time ago is what it is. Yeah, that's uh, um, that's borderline so embarrassing, sh- considering they get, what, 50,000 every week, give yeah. or take? Yeah. yeah. But uh, shout out to Newcastle. Um, they are sort of doing their thing and getting by at the moment, but Huddersfield, um, they, they, they look to be a goner. Yeah, if you're a betting man and you still haven't bet on Huddersfield going down and you just want to earn a couple of quid, I chuck some money on them. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Um, Palace Leicester. This is one of those games, again, which could go either way. And one of the reasons, quite frankly, again, I don't bet because I would have backed Leicester to have at least got a point from this. But Milohojevic, um, again, one of the most underrated players in the Premier League, might I add, mm-hmm. comes through. You look at Palace and you you think to yourself, who's going to do it if Zaha doesn't do it? This guy is so consistent. Bro, he is just incredible. Again, Palace, I don't know the ins and outs of Milohojevic, his ambitions or his contract, but I imagine if Palace were to have a pretty shitty season, he'd have plenty of suitors at the end of the season yeah. that would say, you know what, come play for us. He could easily play at a top level. He's very consistent, is what he is. He's a very consistent player. You, you don't see him, he uh, see him, I beg your pardon, have a bad game. When you see his ratings that they give him after most games, you know some players will have an eight one week, a four the next, or a five. He tends to be like a six or a seven every single week. Mm. Um, and it's players that can sort of keep in Crystal Palace together at the moment. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. And, and I, I read something very interesting about him that since his debut in February twenty seventeen, no. Uh, Crystal Palace player scored more goals than him. Really, Zaha scored. That 15. explains a lot, actually. Zaha scored fifteen goals. Uh, Miller, Miller, Milojevic. My turn. Um, Mil- Luka Mil- Milojevic, Milojevic, whatever. Milojevic, Mil- Milojevic. Something like that. Yeah. Luka. Luka. We'll go with okay, Luka. Luka. He's got sixteen goals, uh, which is one more than Zaha. That's incredible. It's a great return. So, what an influence that is. And yes, there will be people who say a lot of those are penalties, which they are. We still got to put the ball in the net. Yeah, they're, they're, you know what? Don't underestimate how hard it is to take a penalty as well. When you've got all eyes on you and everybody's holding their breath, waiting for you to take a strike, it isn't easy. It's, it is a skill in itself. So for him to do it 
and to do it that effectively gotta give him props and one thing I will say is the goal he scored this weekend wasn't a fucking penalty let me tell you no. it was an absolute thunderbolt yeah great strike I was watching it and I remember you, you know, it's one of those shots you know when you're behind it you can see it going straight in mm-hmm. and I was just like wow whoever got that very point, clean hit yeah very clean yeah. hit yeah um, Leicester though not so good um, you know we, we've talked about them in, in, in many a positive way this season but yeah um, that's three on the bounce they've lost now and that's the first time they've lost three games in a row without scoring a goal since 2002. Really? Wow. It's a 16 years since that's happened to them. So uh, you can normally count on Leicester, and I'm pretty sure I've given stats in episodes gone by about them, that they, they've they scored a goal in every game this season. Yeah. Um, up until this run of three games where mm. they haven't. Um, so they're not in, a, in in their best sort of shape at the moment, but I don't have any doubt that they'll do. They'll be yeah, fine, I don't think know? Leicester will struggle in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Again, what I will say dip. is, Leicester, depending on the type of season they have, certain players may get picked off. Yeah. You look at your Maguires. You look at your. I I don't think um, would Vardy go? Do you reckon? Do you think Vardy would maybe have one more challenge? Because he's always said he wants to play yeah. abroad. Yeah. I'd be interested to see if he would actually go and maybe do that. Because he's, how old is he now? 31, 32, Vardy? Depends on his options. I think he is 32, I'm going to say. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. But, you know, it's it depending on where they finish. Like you say, if he was to get a tempting enough offer... Um, you may call it quits, then would yeah. You, would you blame him? Uh, no. Given, given the fact he's come from absolutely nothing and he's done so much for Leicester. Leicester have done a lot for him, but he's done a lot for Leicester. So I would say, yeah, if Vardy got, got an offer to go play in... Spain or Greece or, or Turkey or anywhere else, I think he'd take it. I think he's an ambitious guy. If I was him, I probably would take it as well. Yeah. He's achieved far, far more than what he ever yeah, oh, bro, he look, would in like, his career. Yeah, I mean, look, that guy was set to work, you know. Fleet, he, was it Fleetwood he was Fleetwood, Fleetwood Town? I'm, yeah. I, I'm assuming it is. The name rings a bell. But he was just set to be Joe Average. He was going to work in normal life, do maybe a nine to five, play football on the side. So for him to get where he has, there'll probably be a movie about him as well at some point. Pretty sure there is, isn't it? Oh. Is there? I, I know there was maybe one in the works, but there, there probably will be one at some point. Yeah, but I can certainly see, like you said, uh, you know, some of their players maybe getting um, sort of poached on. You look at Damari Gray. Yeah, He's Gray's a good player, well. yeah. Um, you're looking at players like, just looking at the team sheet now, Madison, Albrighton. Ian um, still a very good player as well. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Casper like. Schmeichel. Yeah. Johnny Evans, yeah, Pereira right back to, yeah. Casper Schmeichel, yeah, he'll be a big one, actually, if they can keep him. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, shout-out to Leicester. They'll be fine. Um, last game, then, Man City-Everton. Um, scoreline didn't really surprise me, to be honest with you. No. I thought Everton would have maybe made more of a game of it. One thing I'll say very briefly about Everton's tactics. If you watch Man City this season, they are defensively... They're a little shaky. As I've said to you last week and weeks gone by, they're not the greatest defence that's ever lived. They do have a soft centre. Now, Everton were trying to play the ball out from the back, at which point they got exposed. I think it was a Yeri Mina pass from uh, Jordan Pickford. So it was Pickford to Mina. Mina tried to play it out. They lost it. Man City go through. They score. Sometimes when you play against a team that that presses the ball so well, you have to go over the press. So you can't get around the press, especially with Man City, because they're so good at it. Like Pep has that six-second rule where he wants the ball back ASAP. So if you're Everton, you've got Calvin lewin up front, who, again, he's a relatively big lad. He's not small. Mm-hmm. You know, he can cause the two centre-halves some problems. Go over the press. I don't see why you just don't go direct and just make life difficult for them. I know he has a certain style of football he wants to play, and I commend that. It's courageous, and it's quite noble that he wants to do that at the Etihad. But just go over the press. Yeah. I don't understand the issue. No, it's a, it's a very val- uh, valid point. Um, the, the only thing I would say to that is when teams do get a chance to try and do that against Man City, um, I don't know whether it's the case that they've been so hardly worked at that point in the game, you know, just chasing the game and chasing the game um, up until that point that... You know, have this? Have they got the energy to do that? You would, you would hope. But if you st- if you start that way, at least at if least at least play the percentages and mm-hmm. try and you know get get a knockdown, get a free kick, get some type of corner. Play the percentages. It's, it's difficult, isn't it? You know, when you've got a manager that believes a certain way. Um, you know, we know Mourinho is a, is something like that as well. That if it's in a manager sort of DNA to play a certain style of football, it's hard for them to do anything. It, I, like I get that. that yeah, 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 I get that. Yeah. Uh, but no, like you said, the, the scoreline um, didn't really surprise me. Um, they did sort of come back into it very briefly. 
uh, but Sterling came on and pretty much halted any sort of uh, dreams he had of, of, of a comeback. Yeah. Um, the only thing that he could have really done after the week he'd had, Sterling, um, just come on, did his business and scored a goal straight away. Um, only a second ever headed goal, by the way, as well. Really? Only second ever. And um, a couple of um, interesting stats, actually, um, which I did see. Um, since Guardiola has become manager of City, Everton have scored more goals against City than any other team. Interesting. Um, not that it's doing them much good, by the way, because they still lost. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they've scored more than any other team have against City. Um, Sane, who assisted both goals for Jesus, has never previously assisted a goal for Jesus. Has he not? No. Well, I was like, really? That sounds, yeah, that sounds... Everyone, um, like, everyone assists for everyone. In yeah, and they've scored like 8,000 goals over yeah, the past and, season as well. And I was just convinced that like 3,000 of those were from San That's interesting, yeah. But no, that, that's his first and second one. Um, and all 21 games that City have won this season, they've scored in the first half. The five in which they have not won this season... Taking control, they, yeah. They have not scored in the first half. Interesting. So that tells you that when they do go 1-0 up, like it kind of plays into your point that if you start a certain way mm. and you can press them and, and get ahead, then it sort of cracks their confidence a little bit. Yeah, but, but once they get ahead, there's no stopping them. them. Yeah, then, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's it. That's true, yeah. No, that's very true. All right, cool, bro. Um, In terms of the Premier League, we leave it at that for now. Mm -hmm. um, players of the weekend, I've gone for Robertson, you've gone for De La Feu. Mm -hmm. Cool. Bring us the Euro roundup, bro. Let us know what's going on. Cool. So just very quickly before we get to a couple of Twitter Q&As, um, Lionel Messi scored a hat-trick and, as I said earlier, assisted two goals um, on the weekend as they thrashed Levante 5-0 to go five clear. Mm -hmm. Athletic Madrid and uh, Sevilla both won to stay three points off the top. And two very, very good, I don't know if you saw them, very good Thibaut Courtois saves in injury I didn't time. see them, no, I didn't um, actually. He hasn't done a lot of good this season, apart from concede goals. Mm. Um, but two very good saves by him in injury time um, got Real Madrid a very nervy 1-0 win at home okay. to Rayo Vallecano, which keeps them in fourth. Um, Dortmund maintained their unbeaten start with another 2-1 win, um, whilst Bayern thrash Hanover and... Uh, Borussia Mönchengladbach dropped points so Mönchengladbach and Bayern Munich both sit nine points behind Dortmund now who as I say remain unbeaten yep um, Daily Blind as I told you yeah I can't score a hat trick yeah. Blind um, with a hat trick in wow an eight nil win what a time to be alive <sighs> someone actually as well put a bet on him to score a hat trick no that's that, that's what on in that game in that game no match fixing sixty seven to one match fixing ten pound he put on I'm it. telling you now there's match fixing you happens. don't you don't bet who the fuck bets on Daily Blind to score a hat-trick in any game. I wouldn't bet him to score a hat-trick in training. <laughs> and now you're telling me someone got 66 to 1 and it came in. <laughs> he scored, he gets forward a lot. No, all I can sorry, say no. If whoever's in the Eredivisie, <laughs> you need to look into that match-fixing because I'm not buying into that. If Daily Blind gets a hat-trick and someone actually has money on it, Daily Blind is getting a slice of that money. So no, I'm not accepting that. But I'm not going to try and um, pronounce the team that they beat. because Ooh, it's, Ajax. Yeah, it's very, very Dutch. Um, I haven't even written it down because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's dare someone dig nah, nah just leave it there I asked um, one that's all the I asked one 8 nil. it's probably better on that team that they don't get mentioned yeah no that's fine we won't we uh, won't <laughs> Ronaldo's 11th league goal helps you with a 1-0 win over Torino um, which again keeps them unbeaten um, and that pretty much sums up the European roundup um, very quickly um, yeah we received two questions on the Twitter and Q&A this week. Yeah. Um, the first one's from um, my good friend Luke Edwards. Um, and he asked, if Celtic were a Premier League side, would they get in the top 10? If no, why not? If yes, why? Uh, no. And quite simply, they don't have the quality. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to go with. They have decent players, but the, you look at your Bournemouths, your Watfords, you look at Leicester, you look at West Ham, significantly so yeah. much better. And they couldn't beat. I think it was was it. I don't know. Is it not Salzburg or Strasbourg or someone in the Europa League? They couldn't beat to get yeah. through or Rosenborg or someone along those lines. Um, and they lost and they just went through because other results went their way. Mm. Um, do you think they would stay in the Premier League or do you think they would be? I think they, I think I think they'd potentially stay there. It depends on the type of season they'd have. They'd be very close to the bottom though. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be backing them for any top 10 So you're putting them within the fight around amongst your Newcastle, your Brighton, Southampton. Yeah, yeah 100%. Like yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'd agree with that as well. Um, the second question we've had is from Rhys. Um, and he has said that, as we know, City are a great attacking outfit. Correct, I'm right. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but as we've touched on as well, he said, how weak 
can they be when pressed and would they be punished or will they be punished for this in the later stages of the Champions League? Yes, I think they will. Again, I think that's... Uh, they do have issues. For all the money they've spent and as good as they are, they have a very soft centre. Yeah. A very, very soft centre. I'm... I... Uh, it's hard. Do you know a young Vincent company? He would have been immaculate in that back four. Mm. A younger Vincent Company. Now he's, his day is done. He's run he's his race. It, yeah. yeah, he's kind of passed it. And that's no disrespect to Vincent Company because he is an incredible defender or was an incredible defender, still is a very good defender. He would have really made them a powerful a powerful unit and a force. I don't get that impression with Stones. Yeah. Laporte I quite like, but again, I'm not overly sure about him yet. He hasn't. He hasn't really stood out like a Van Dyke has. So yeah, he's got. I, I do like. I do like Laporte though. I prefer Laporte to Stones. Yeah, he's definitely got the ingredients. Yeah. Um, to be a top centre half, and I do believe um that he is um not maybe um as Van Dyke is at the moment. Mm. Um, but I agree with what you're saying in, in sort of general because they've had two games against Leon um in the Champions League group stage, one in which they lost and the yeah. they drew, wasn't it? Yeah, they did. And they weren't um, overly impressive against Hoffenheim either, from what I so, remember. No, that's correct. And sort of if you look at it wasn't quite over two legs as such, but over two games against Leon, Le- if that were mm. a, you know, a, a knockout tie, they would have lost. Yeah. Um and again, if it was a knockout tie, I'm sure they would have, you know, maybe been slightly different. Yeah. But if we look at it from that perspective, so if Leon are scoring goals um, against them, sort of the way in which what they the did, top teams do? then you know, they, they've, we know the fate of the size of they got Schalke and mm. they're away to Schalke first. I think Schalke are sort of bottom half. They'll breathe, the they'll breeze that, yeah. So they'll you'd they'll breeze expect it. them to breeze that. But if they sort of draw you know, a top European side, then it would be very interesting to see how they deal yeah, with that. I think they'd struggle against a yeah. top European and side. It kind of ties in with the start. I said, I think it depends on how they start. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, if they start well, then you know they get into that momentum, momentum and a rhythm. Very difficult to stop. The stats but, will tell you that if they start well, they're very difficult to stop, and l- probably likely won't be stopped. But if they are stopped early on, like Liverpool did in the Champions yeah, League, yeah, yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah, there's your example. Any teams that want to beat City, just go back and look at the Liverpool games. Mm-hmm. They um they pressed them well, and they they broke and they um they they made City look pretty average. They, one thing I will say, they, they don't seem to have a plan B. City. No, there isn't. No. They pretty much, and we're so used to them blowing teams away, mm. that when a team like Liverpool does do a job on them, we sort of go, oh, we almost act surprised. But yeah. all, it, all it ever tells us is that they don't have a plan B, really. When a team figures them out, they figure them out. Yeah. They'll be interested to see, but to answer Reese's question, I think, yeah, they'll yeah. potentially struggle um, in the later stages of the Champions League. And I don't think they'll win the Champions League or an English side will win the Champions no. League either. No, but anyway, that's it from us today, guys. So if you are seeing this, it's worked. We're YouTube stars, finally. It's finally worked. If it hasn't worked, it'll be on SoundCloud. It'll be on SoundCloud regardless anyway. But subscribe, follow us on Twitter. Again, our ads are all going to be on the video after this. Let us know what you think about the video. Comment below, subscribe, all that jazz. We'll be back same time next week. Till next time, people. Ciao.